great to see all of you. Uh, my name is Ben Doyle. I'm an area director for USDA Rural Development. Uh, we're a federal agency whose mission is to improve the quality of life and economic vitality of rural America. And we do that by making strategic investments in a number of different areas, but most significantly in housing, um, which, you know, in our office, we always say housing's where jobs go to sleep at night. And it's just really the bedrock of any rural community. And um, so I was really excited to see that this was one of the sessions that was identified for Washington County. And, you know, um, Jenna and Josh really already gave a great overview of, of what we're doing here tonight. Um, I'm going to serve as the facilitator of this session. And, uh, you know, as such, my role really is just to help guide us through a series of kind of questions that uh, we've been asked to ask of this group. Um, and as Jenna said, we're not, we're not here to develop another strategic plan or an action plan, but we are here to really listen to what's happening on the ground in Washington County and to think about what are the good things that are happening, what are the gaps, what are the, the needs for this community, and most importantly, like what, what does Washington County want for its future? And all of that, you know, is going to enter into the kind of wide end of this funnel and will be um, kind of synthesized and brought to the governor's task force as they consider what are the kinds of things that need to happen in Vermont writ large, but also specifically in Washington County to ensure that there's an equitable economic recovery um, coming out of COVID. So that's really what we're going to try to do tonight. And again, um, my job is really more than anything else, just like a timekeeper. You know, I just have a kind of series of questions that we're going to kind of go through and I'll just run through them quickly. First, we're going to get a kind of spark story um, from Eileen Peltier, who is a, a, you know, a resident housing expert and doing great work at Downstreet Housing. And she's going to share some kind of five minutes of kind of inspiration of what they're doing, what's already happening in Washington County and some best practices around um, challenges around uh, homelessness and, and housing. And from there, we're going to talk more broadly about what do we want for our community um, when we're talking about housing and ending uh, homelessness in our, in our region. And then we're going to ask the question, we're going to spend about 10 minutes, what's holding us back from achieving this, right? What are the challenges, both pre-COVID and now, that are preventing us from achieving those goals? And then we're going to spend about 20 minutes considering what are the, um, are there promising practices or strategies or programs emerging today, either ones that were working before or that are really innovative coming out of COVID um, that should be brought forward? And then we'll consider what are the things that are still needed, right? What are the action items that are still needed both locally, regionally, and at the state level to address these challenges that have been identified? So we're gonna go through those in a very kind of structured way. And then at the very end, we're going to hear from our great um, uh, partners on the call, folks like Josh, uh, the Commissioner of Housing, to, to really um, reflect back on what they've heard, right? What are, what, are, what are they hearing that's unique in Washington County, and how does that correspond to what they've heard from other parts of the state? So does anybody have any questions before we, we dive right in? Great. And, um, you know, I would just say too, as we have this conversation, I can see most of you on the on the screen now. Um, so I would say, you know, as we have the conversation, just you know, raise your hand and I'll I'll call on you and you unmute yourself and and um, have at it. So with that, I'm really excited to hear from Eileen, who's the executive director of Down Street Housing, and uh, has, you know, as a resident of Washington County. And as someone who uh, works at USDA, I, I know the incredible work that they do every day that's incredibly innovative and really excited to hear from Eileen about um, what, what you've seen and, and what kind of inspiration you can provide the group. Great, well, thanks for inviting me, Ben. Um, good evening, everyone. So I'm Eileen Peltz here. I'm the Executive Director at Downstreet Housing and Community Development. Although I saw on the other screen, it said CVCLT, our old name. <laughs> a little flashback there. Um, <laughs> So I have a few thoughts. I think uh, I more want to focus on just helping you frame the what how you might want to think about this versus telling you what to do because uh, there's really no such thing as a housing expert. There's so many unique complex needs out there. Um, so March 13th, um, COVID became real. The governor said, stay safe, stay home. That was something that many of us were able to do easily. Right. Um, I know I ran to the grocery store and stocked up on supplies and essentials, toilet paper, all that stuff. Um, but too many central Vermonters didn't even have a home. We were privileged. We were incredibly privileged to have a place to call home. 
Um, that's a reality that existed before COVID and COVID um, has really put a spotlight on that challenge. And I think that's really the reason that Central Vermont probably put this on our agenda. It's a real issue um, and COVID has highlighted it. Um, in addition to stay, stay, stay home, um, we've all heard the term housing is healthcare. It's been around for probably a decade. It's a lot of the work that I do um, is at this intersection of health and housing. And again, it really highlighted this idea that um, having a home is healthcare. Um, what I want to talk about is I'm going to spend just really like about hopefully about 60 seconds giving you what I think is the environment in central Vermont and then jump to some um, solutions that I think that are out there. Um, central Vermont, at best, we've got about a 1% vacancy rate. Um, for the first time, probably in many, many years today, we have vouchers available um, because of a variety of different things, but related to COVID. And we don't have enough housing to put those, to use those vouchers, the flip of what we typically are experiencing. Um, the cost of construction is consistently for many years now higher than what people can afford to pay for rent, which is why we don't see development in central Vermont beyond what an organization like Downstreet can do with many of the federal and state sources that come into a deal. Um, we are looking at uh, an incredible challenge on the home ownership side. Uh, for someone trying to buy a home at an affordable uh, rate, it is nearly impossible. We're seeing this um, in all regions of the country where people imagine it's a safe place. And as we know, we've been fortunate to be in Vermont and probably the safest state in the union. Um, so people are buying homes for a million dollars that are valued at $600,000, $200,000 homes are going for $300,000. Um, we cannot uh, find home ownership for people today. And that challenge, I think, is going to continue for, for some time to come. Um, our tourist economy, um, second homes and Airbnbs sort of relate to that, really put pressure on the amount of homes that are available in central Vermont. Um, you know, in the 1950s, there were over 10,000 people living in Montpelier today, you know, a couple thousand less than that. And part of that is due to the, the um, how we how we live, you know, they're very, there's five bedrooms and there's two people living in the house, right? That's part of it. But it is also the, the tourist economy, second home and Airbnb that's really putting pressure um, on our ability to um, find homes for people. Um, homelessness. I think it was probably a surprise to some people in central Vermont that, that Washington and uh, central Vermont was the second highest uh, number of homeless people in hotels when, when COVID happened and the state uh, very smartly put people into hotels. At the height of it, we had more than 260 people. Today, as of, well, all right, this is a week old, but basically today we had about 160 people um, sorry, households in hotels, another 60 people on the streets um, as of a week ago. Um, these, are, these are significant numbers for a small community like ours. Um, so there are a lot of, you know, those are some of the things that are sort of behind the scenes, many of which existed before COVID. But as I said, you know, housing is healthcare and stay, stay, stay home, stay safe is what it's all about today. And that's a challenge for far too many central Vermonters. Um, so lot, there are lots of innovative solutions, but what I want to take a moment and say is that housing is as unique and varied um, as the number of people you know, uh, on this call plus a few zeros, right? It's unique for each individual. So when we need to have a variety of solutions and I often think we tend to think, oh, let's just do 10 more Taylor Streets um, you know, or a great project like that. Um, that's not the solution. That's not going to get us there. It's part of the solution, um, but we need to be innovative. And so some of the things that are out there just to, and many of you I know on this call, and I know you're aware of these, so I'll just run through them quickly. Um, you know, there has been a real push in the state to buy hotels. Um, didn't work for us in central Vermont. Um, and I don't know that that's really a, you know, a long-term solution to um, the need for housing, but um, it is certainly one option. Uh, tiny home communities um, or tiny homes and in infill sites like we've done on Brook Street in Barrie, um, there is a huge amount of is interest in the state in doing that. And it is a very viable, appropriate option for some individuals. There's a lot of interest in that type of housing. 
accessory dwelling units. I cannot tell you the number of people that I have spoken to in the past year since we did our first tiny house um, about interest in ADUs. Um, if you think about that Montpelier, those you know 10,000 people living here um, in the 50s, uh, maybe we add an ADU next to that home that may have an extra bedroom, but because of the way we live, we don't want to have individuals you know in our home. How do we create? Um, you know, the right zoning, the right opportunities to have um, ADUs um, sitting next to that, you know, old Victorian on the hill in Montpelier. Um, and that gets at density and it helps address climate change as well. Um, we also have a need for, and for some people who really need a congregate setting for permanent, where there's permanent supportive housing options. So services, um, that's a population of the need. Um, where do we go with shelters uh, in central Vermont? It's a big question for our community right now. Our shelter you know, had to close down because we couldn't be CDC compliant. We have you know, reopened the shelter in Barrie, but at a much reduced density. Um, what, you know, what's our solution there um, for the short term and the long term? Um, we are operating the rental rehab program. We have a lot of uh, apartments in central Vermont that are offline for a number of reasons. Um, when you talk to landlords, it's about things like, um, you know, the, the cost of eviction, the cost of uh, damage to the unit. Could we have a risk pool? Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, unique reasons why, Pete, why landlords choose to keep our property offline, but how, how do we address those barriers and get those units back online? Um, for some people, recover residents are what is needed. We have, uh, we're seeing a huge increase in numbers of substance use in 2020. I think I saw, I may not have this exactly right, something like 35 or 40% increase in the number of overdose deaths in 2020 compared to 2019. Um, that's an ongoing challenge and that's a unique form of housing that individuals need. And um, of course we need additional just new construction, both uh, market rate and affordable. So um, I think what I'm saying is uh, there are a lot of needs and I'm curious, really curious to hear what all of you think about um, how we approach those needs I've identified or what are other needs that you're seeing in the community or in Central Vermont. Super, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I mean, it really, I think a really great kind of um, really in a way comprehensive framing of the conversation. So thank you for providing that um, perspective. And you know, with that, I think we really should just open it up with our kind of first question of when we think around the, the challenges around housing and homelessness in Washington County, and those are some pretty, pretty stark numbers that we've heard. Uh, um, what, what do we want for our community uh, in this area, right? In the, in the housing sector, what is it, what will, what do, what do we hope for? What's our aspirational goal for what um, providing housing for everyone and, and, and ending homelessness in, in our community? What does that look like? So please, anyone that, uh, you know, if you'd, if you'd like to talk about what, what that would look like for you, um, please just raise your hand and get started. And, and as Paul, as Paul likes to say, this is just like therapy. We can, I can just, we can just sit and uh, enjoy the silence too. But I, I know that there's a lot of great experts on, or not experts, but a lot of great people that have a perspective to share. So please jump in. Yes, Ryan, please. I'll start us off. Uh, th thank thank you. you very much for putting this together. And thank you, Eileen, for all that you had to share. Um, so I work at the Barry Community Justice Center. We serve uh, people who are re-entering community from incarceration and uh, have 11 transitional housing beds in uh, Washington County, specifically Barry City. Um, so I was really happy to hear um, Eileen bring up recovery supported housing. Um, looking at it through the lens of the work that I do, there's definitely a huge lack in uh, central Vermont for recovery supported housing, specifically for women. Um, there are, there is some beds in Washington County for men and um, young adults, 25 and under at um, here, here in Barrie, but there's really no recovery supported um, housing for women in central Vermont. I know V4 had 
made a move for my foundation for recovery. I'd made a move to get housing in Barry, and I don't know where that's at. I think that might be stalled at the moment. So um, that is, you know, definitely one lens that I'm looking at. And in conjunction with the new legislation that is being that is going into effect in January, the Adjustment Justice and Reinvestment Act, um, more and more people are going to be coming back to their home communities from incarceration without recovery supports in place, um, let alone without uh, recovery services, whether it be through transitional housing agencies like ourselves or other, um, because doing away with the furlough system, while it's really beneficial, and I think that it's very positive in general in reducing uh, our incarcerated population, um, more and more people will be coming to the community on parole and not have that requirement of having um, an approved residence or transitional housing where they get those wraparound services. So for me and my work, that's definitely a lens in which I'm looking through it. And much of what Eileen said is in my personal life, that is how I feel. But in my work life, that is very much um, the lens that I'm looking through right now. Thanks, Ryan. I, I appreciate that perspective. And so just to kind of um, recap it within the context of like, what do we, what do we hope to see you know, in the future in our region uh, around this issue. I mean, what I heard from you is, you know, uh, filling some of those gaps, right? Particularly around recovery housing and wraparound services for folks as we think about uh, reintegrating folks into our community, wh whatever situation they're coming from, whether they're incarcerated, but, you know, uh, I guess a, a housing landscape that provides options for folks like that to kind of re-enter into our communities in, in a sustainable yeah. way. I really, I don't want to yeah. Uh, that Ryan was highlighting uh, recovery residents for women, which are a particular challenge. And Ryan, we're on it. We're waiting on some funding and we're, should happen in 2021. Right, Sweet. Jack? Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks for adding that. Yeah, I wasn't sure where it was that. Um, and, and just to one, add one other piece that, that I left out is with more and more people returning to the community from incarceration, um, and during COVID, we've you know seen a mass release of individuals, which is uh, very positive. And then come January, with when the law goes into effect, my concern on that is more and more people are going to be released to homelessness. I don't know if that's necessarily going to be happening or not, um, but it is a big fear of not being in stable housing. So while our numbers right now are high, I, I fear that they're going to increase even more, um, not just because people losing jobs, but also this. And that's all I have. Thank you. No, oh, thanks, Ryan. That's a really valuable perspective. Does somebody else want to give their perspective on what they would hope for uh, in this area? You know, when we think about um, if things were working the way that we hoped that they would what would the housing sector look like in, in uh, Washington County and Central Vermont? Please, Tanya. There you go. Um, I, Tanya, I, I can't hear you. I don't know. If... Mm, I don't see that you're on mute, but I still can't hear you. Hmm. Sorry, sorry, Tanya. Maybe call, maybe call in on, maybe you can call in on the phone and, and join. That would be great. Um, anybody else want to? I'll I'll just throw one other one one thing that we've learned um, from our experience of sort of looking at who is in the hotels. Um, and mm. Brown Street has certainly experienced this when we go to lease up a new building, um, a significant number of elderly women um, who you know, are now widows, who do not have um, a pension are moving into our housing. You know, they're, they're, so they're, they're living on their social security. Um, that's, that's a significant number of the people who are also um, on the, coordinated entry and on waiting lists. So, you know, I don't, just because I think people don't necessarily think of that population, um, it is, and we're, you know, we're an old state. Uh, we're uh, aging by the second here, um, especially with these eating, eating sometimes more quickly than usual. But 
it's it's a real issue out there. Um, and then the other population, I think people are probably more familiar with this, but young people who have a significant college debt, um, who are working, um, you know, just can't afford to um, get an apartment and certainly can't afford to buy a home. So, so all that population, you know, there are different reasons for, for homelessness, right? There are certainly economic reasons, you know, like I just described in those two scenarios. And then there are people who are, you know, struggling with complex, complex multifaceted challenges like substance use disorder and mental health, domestic violence, um, all of these things. And I think we, we need to think about all of these kinds of solutions and, and the housing needs of those populations can be very different. So um, it's just important context to think about who's on that list. And I think almost half the people on the list had some form of income. Um, so, you know, I, I think we get some stereotypes in our head about who homeless people are. And I guess I'm trying to say it's more complicated than that. And nuanced. Yeah. So, I, I mean, is it fair to say that like if things were working the way that they should, right, that the the, the solutions would be able to match the complexity of the challenge faced, right? That there there is a variety of solutions or opportunities for folks to find the housing that's appropriate for them. Right, and you know, and I think that um, in this, in Vermont, you know, we, we tend to sort of pigeonhole homelessness into uh, somebody who has substance use disorder or mental illness, or, you know, there are different types of homelessness, so that's typically more chronic, and there's episodic homelessness, and that number, this episodic homelessness related to um, both the aging population without pensions, because nobody has pensions anymore, and COVID, um, you know, is going to increase these numbers of episodic homelessness and in an environment where we just have no housing available at any cost. Um, that's the real challenge, you know, that we're facing. So those numbers uh, that we see are rising, I think, are, you know, really a mix and maybe even skewed a little bit more to the episodic economic causes of homelessness, which um, might be a new challenge. And that's just pressure on and uh, rents because there's so little housing available. Thank you. I see that um, Lucas Herring has his hand raised. Mr. Mayor, please. Yeah. Sure, so um, sorry, I'm keeping the video off. I'm at another venue and I'm just trying to sneak in while I can here. Um, so one of the questions that I had was actually, if you have one of these Victorians that have five bedrooms and you have a number of widows that could also be housed, is there an opportunity there? And then the follow-up question is, is not related to this, but it's really about the cost for developing new housing. If there's a lot of concern about what the actual cost is, uh, you know, at the legislative level, we see a number of bills that are put into place that actually increase the, the cost to develop new housing. And, you know, we're, we've been trying to work on Act 250 to see if there's other ways to allow housing in different areas with a decreased cost. So maybe it's more of a question for Josh on here, but um, are there any other opportunities that we could look into for decreased cost in housing? Great questions, thanks. Josh, do you wanna answer that now or? I, I mean, I, I can give a quick quick response um, and, and then yeah, I mean, probably be a larger um, sort of uh, theme at the end of this uh, of some of thoughts of what I'm hearing would, would touch on this as well. But um, yeah, I, I get concerned about um, the ever increasing cost of, of building the housing we need and that we're not building um, some of the smaller sort of, you know, um, middle housing they call it, where they're, they're smaller units, they don't necessarily need to be, um, you know, determined affordable housing with a big A and they don't, they're not really high end market. The, the market is just failing us at this point that, we're not having the sort of housing boom that, that does that um, anymore. And it, it costs more to construct a home than it's appraised at the day it's done. And you're not gonna go get a loan to, to build that or to purchase it with that um, scenario where you're underwater to begin with. And you know, you, you're, you're, you're right, Lucas, there are, some of that is, my opinion, is some of our own doing. We have a lot of great policies but they do add cost and we need to recognize that and that if housing is the foundation of, of our society and how people are successful, 
in my view, that's first. You know, the other added on policy um, that we, we get and the benefits there have to be looked at through that lens. And I think sometimes, um, you know, look, look in our communities. Does every community have a housing commission? No, probably most of them have the energy commission right now. I just think, you know, I'm not, I'm not picking winners or losers. I'm just saying there are some um, policies or, or, or uh, things that we gravitate to um, that have an unintended consequence of adding cost and regulation to housing that typical Vermonters could go out on their own and afford to build or buy. Um, and it's complicated and complex. And in my view, it's been building for 40 years, 50 years, and that the last time we actually had housing that was built that met the demand was in the early 80s. And since then, we've been um, stealing from more Collins's housing report, but you know, every year we've been um, reducing what we build in housing by half. In this past decade, we've produced 0.1% increase in housing. We're barely keeping up with the housing that we lose each year, despite the fact that we have investments which are needed and great that are increasing our public investment in building housing to the tune of about $80 million last year in the housing investment report but it's not even keeping up with the housing stock that's lost each year. So there's a underlying problem that um, unless it's addressed, it goes to Eileen's opening comments that we could build French blocks all day long with the resources that we can put and find, and it's still not gonna address the problem if these underlying fundamentals don't shift and change, so. Thanks, Josh. Um, and that's really, and uh, Representative Stevens, I see is your hand up. I just want to say, like, I, unless uh, somebody else has something to add, I'd like to shift the conversation in the direction that it's already going, which is what's holding us back, right? And we just heard, you know, I think really great questions about the regulations or the cost of building house and the fact that they don't appraise out. Um, so, uh, Representative Stevens, what what would you like to share? Well, I think you're muted. How's that? That's good. Um, I think the one word answer is it's politics. Everything is political. Um, it's a joy to be in a meeting, in a Zoom meeting today with um, people who, who not just care about housing, but understand it up and down and backwards. Um, a lot of the difficulties that we've had this year on um, all of these issues that we're talking about, um, new policies or new regulations or new deregulations get hung up on either um, and advocates uh, and advocacy groups needs or wants. Um, we've had, I mean, for instance, we went very far with recovery residences this year, very far from where we'd been before. Um, and uh, full disclosure, I worked with Eileen on the board of Downstreet for, for quite a few years. And this was a project that Eileen really grabbed onto. And so, so I perhaps knew more than my counterparts, but the fact is, is that we got a great bill together and really it got torpedoed because some advocates felt like it didn't protect 100% of the people that were going to be utilizing it. Um, so, and that's without the money, because this is actually a, a, this was actually a program where money wasn't the biggest issue. It was, it was about actually landlord tenant law. And so, and what's the, what's, how do you, how do you, changed landlord tenant law to the degree that allows people in recovery to stay in places where they won't hurt other people if they fall out of recovery. Uh, you know, there's, uh, it could go on for a long time. Um, I've been working with Josh and with the department on trying to understand a bill as 237 that, that we're in the middle of trying to learn about, about zoning, about these middle, this middle housing. Um, and we are getting a lot of pushback from the planners and from VLCT and from uh, municipalities who may not see that that the words traditional housing or exclusionary zone I mean all zoning is exclusionary we don't we're going to prevent people from building so there's no sprawl we've done that as a as a state and that's made other building more expensive um, but what about downtowns where you have access to um, uh, water and sewer which is the, the which is the footprint and capacity if you have capacity um, so we have to thread some needles there about how do you describe exclusionary housing to people in, who aren't in the business, who, who, who don't think that their town is being overly exclusionary 
um, which in this day and age is means about people. I mean, what we learned about COVID, we just spent 90 million, we're going to be spending like $90 million on helping homelessness, helping mitigate homelessness in, in the year 2020. Like of all the things that, that we came into this year with, COVID provided us with upwards of $90 million to, to do this. And VHCB is going to end up spending close to $35 million on some of the issues on buying motels. And just think about how many units are going to get, 250 units for $32 million. It's not enough. Right, but the money is, the money is finite, and it's always finite. This was this was this weird little, weird thing that happened that allowed us to make these investments, and we're not going to cure it this year. We're going to make a lot of, we're going to make a lot of improvements. So, it, it, this is a long way. I'm sorry, it's been a frustrating week for me. So, um, understanding that that. Um, the advocacy of the groups that are here on this call, it, it, all of them, but you know, it's it important because voices get heard in a certain way. I think we move the ball forward on people understanding to, to Eileen's point earlier about what the stereotype of homelessness is. Um, I don't think it was erased or eradicated, but I think a lot of people um, in the state house in this year's classes understood that it wasn't just the stereotype of what you think a homeless person is. Um, they had neighbors, they had friends who were at, who are at risk. Um, 80,000 people had to apply for unemployment. Um, how long that lasts? I, I don't know. I mean, I, there are days where I feel like this was the best year for the purposes of the missions of the affordable housing industrial complex, as I like to call it. Um, but on the other hand, I think it's also something that people are going to forget very soon if we don't keep the, the voice up. And so, you know, it's hard in that building or what passes for that building now. Um, somebody coined the phrase Zoom peelier. Um, it is difficult to get everybody on board to make sure, um, like in the musical Hamilton, do you have the votes? It's that simple. Do you have the votes? So um, thank you, Tom. I mean, I think, you know, what I, again, what I heard is the short answer is politics. What I heard in the kind of longer answer, right, is, is really just continuing to raise awareness about the complexity and the challenges of this issue and to try and build a lasting kind of consensus around it uh, in terms of how we move the ball forward. And yes, and then working with an administration where, I mean, the, Josh's team is great, um, but, but it's finite as well. Their power is finite as well. I mean, we have a great year with Josh, but it is, um, if it comes down to money, um, a lot of people have to weigh in on that. Yeah. And if it comes down to policy, a lot of people have to weigh in on that and, um, and believe in it and move it forward. Thank you. And Does Paul Costello called this therapy. That's what it felt like. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Eileen, do you have something you'd like to add? Um, <laughs> I'm glad we could support your therapy, Tom. Um, I don't want to miss what, what Lucas said about, um, you know, buying a Victorian and having uh, five elderly women live there. I, I just to sort of try to throw something pretty out of the box, um, and I, I tossed it out there in my intro comments a little bit. You know, this idea of uh, of density, of finding a way for like if I if we're trying to come up with this sort of what do I want for this community? I want to have a way to deal with the fact that I walk every morning at 530 and I probably see 10 unique homeless people in downtown Montpelier. And most of the time, although not during COVID, um, you know, I have an extra bedroom here. How can we create a system that would allow me, me who does this work, who actually talks to the homeless people out there and, you know, um, is has some level of comfort with it, how I can support that and bring somebody into my home. Why can't we think, you know, differently about this? We've got, I